It is May the 25th, 2024. I'm Chris. I'm back. And this is The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. I missed you guys. Adrian, Hello. Jeremiah. It was rough without you, but we, we muddled through. <sighs> yeah. Welcome no, I'm back. really happy. I'm really happy to be back. I'm also I was also very happy when I was gone because because of what I did. So <laughs> it's uh it's with a, with a crying and a laughing face that I'm back. Oh, that's okay. Yes, all right. Well, you know, that's, well, well, it makes it nicer to come back if you've had a bit of a break, isn't it? So, you know. Not that this is ever a chore, this podcast. This is always one of the high points of my week, you know. It's like it's always it's like, oh brilliant, I've got to do TFOP today. That's fantastic. Excellent. Really love it. Yeah. So yeah, what 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 I was doing was I held a workshop as every year in the south of Germany in an old abbey. And it's it's probably my favorite thing to do. Um usually around may sometime and uh this year again we were 30 people in total 27 participants um and three teachers and it was a lot of hands-on and that's what i want to talk about today so um just to give you an idea here's here's a little behind the scenes kind of video one of the participants documented the entire thing and put stuff online so well that's lucky that video was almost my pick of the week so <laughs> <laughs> no but so it was good good job i chose something else it, it was it was really good because it showcases a few things um that i want to talk about but before we go there i want to talk about something else and that is uh, something that became clear to me during the workshop um and it it it's about AI and photography. So okay, never talked about that before. <laughs> well, and I don't really want to talk about AI here, um, at least not today. But just the other day, I watched a video of someone talking about AI and music because you, you might have heard the the, sure. the systems now that can pretty much spit out a track with a. Mm with its own lyrics about anything in any style. And there's, yeah. these things sound really good. And um, and there's a, there's a guy who, who did a YouTube video where he talks about that, about the technology, about the results. And then he also interviews Rick Beato. <clears throat> and uh, Rick okay. Beato is a musician, a producer, um, and he has a very, uh, very well-known music YouTube channel and has a lot of opinions about things and also plays with everything that's out there. So, um, and they talked about a few things that I think are really very parallel to photography. I mean, we can agree that photography will be in parts taken over by AI. That's a given when we look at stock photography, when we look at some other things. Um, but one thing I noticed on the workshop is that still, even with AI being as good as it is, as it is now, uh, even now, AI only surfaced once in an entire week of workshop. And it did not surface as photography, but as audio. So okay. um, the, the guy who does the interview with Rick Beato asks him about... Um, if he thinks music will go away and the answer is very very obviously also compatible with photography because he says of course not i love playing the guitar i love picking up the guitar and making music and whatever that these systems create i will still love picking up a guitar and um that's what happens on the workshop everyone wants to do photography that's why they're there so photography as a as a hands-on medium as a hands-on medium is here to stay and that is very obvious sure it is. also well, i mean they also talk about income musicians income and that will certainly change um but i think also, when chris about output because <clears throat> we, we're very used to printing 
instead of, you know, using a machine, just sending it through, that's pretty much hands off rather than getting your, your hands wet in chemicals. And mm -hmm. there's a joy to the hands on in creating the final image as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And then at the same time, when he gets asked if he's, if he's excited in any way about AI, he says, of course I am. Because it in music, it'll take away a lot of the chores, um, like doing a rough mix of a track, doing mastering, these kind of things. AI can do really well, and it will certainly take over these fields. So, And also, um, this is relevant both to photography and to music. Yes. Is the... The, the idea that we are trying to recreate music in the style or conditions that we are used to, whether it's symphonic, uh, whether it's rock, pop, rap, you know, with the lyrical assumptions associated with uh, that. Um, instead of going to the tools to say, what is the next step in music? How can we use the tools as a new instrumentation? There are not that many people doing this. Holly Herndon, if you know her work, and if you don't, I would encourage everybody to do a deep dive into what she and her partner are doing, both visually, but she's training her own models. She's traveling around Europe. She spent a lot of time in Berlin. She traveled around Europe and, and recording choirs, chorales, uh, in various ways, and then processes it in her own model to create music that is, I'm going to say, more unique than anything else that I have heard with AI. Some of it pleasant, some of it odd, <clears throat> but new nonetheless. And I think that artists, not necessarily commercial artists who are there to emulate. You can use that to create a jingle or whatnot. But when you're using those tools to push the levels of what is possible, what you have not seen or heard before, then it becomes very interesting rather right. than generic. So, so lots, of, lots of parallels to photography. I, I, I found this video very like interesting and especially the take on... on music that uh, Rick Beato has. So that, that link goes in the show notes. And then back to photography, we played with like a, a ton of things. Um, one, of the, one of the hallmarks of that workshop is that there's a lot of freedom for smaller groups to do their own projects. So groups of two, three, four people decide what they want to work on during that week with the goal of presenting it on the Friday um, in front of probably like 70 people um and uh, and that's that it's, it's a big i'd say a big creative playground of sorts and it's also it also yields a good mix of different styles of photography projects some more tech focused some more um composition focused lots of exploration going on um there's, there's there was also a parallel workshop at the same time for wood sculpture. So there were people working on their sculptures for the entire week. And that there's a lot of cross pollination going on there during that week. And uh, I would like to bring up two projects that were quite impressive. Um, and the first one is a large format camera. I've already posted that in our Discord, so um, you've probably seen that. But um, so there's there's this group, and they have they have agreed before what they wanted to do, but just in a rough way. Uh, one of the guys had access to um, to a trailer, and the trailer is. Um, it, one of those drink sales kind of places, you know, with a, with a big window on the side. And, uh, and they decided to turn that into a camera, into a super large format camera. And it was so amazing what these guys managed to pull together in just a few days there. So they went to, uh, to a DIY store. They bought a big wooden board to close 
one of the windows because they couldn't drill a hole in the wall. And uh, for lens, they tried with a large format lens that didn't work because of the because of the distance to the um, to the film, and they ended up using glasses from a. Um, just just normal lenses pretty much from glasses um, that projected at the right distance. Um, they actually built a lens with two of these lenses, so they they played with that. Lots of experience there. And then they, as a medium, started off with positive film, as in 50 by 60 centimeters um, of positive film. They built a, a back standard from a rolling desk from a rolling office chair and a flip chart <laughs> that they glued together uh, so a lot of a lot of improvisation but they ended up taking portraits of a lot of people they ended up doing the group shot with that thing um, and just watching that process of problem solving over and over again how do we get the how do we get a hole in there how do we what what kind of lenses do we have at our disposal? How do we fix the film at the right spot? Um, they ended up using that that whole trailer as a dark room. So, so someone was inside the camera fixing everything and then uh, developing. Um, it's one of so it was it was like one of these Afghan box cameras. Yeah, but in large. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Literally yeah, so really, really as well. with with little people inside the, the yeah, camera, yeah, with little yeah. people doing doing the work. But Bayard like would have been Pratchett very things. very proud. Probably, right? yeah. Uh, it's it's just if you if you've had the experience of like someone converting a room into a pinhole camera, which is fairly easy. You just need black foil and uh, and some tape and close it up, and then you see everything. Well, that's outside, upside down on the other side in the room. Um, being in there was like that because the picture was projected with a huge wide angle. So you ended up having like an image circle that covered the walls and the floor and everything. And um, it, it, was a, it was an amazing hands-on experience. But just doing, having some time, having a, an environment that allows you to play and that ended up becoming one of my favorite projects there. Not 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 to diminish all the others that were excellent, but that one was just very notable because you could not you couldn't not notice it. So that's, hands that's on, fantastic! <laughs> so everybody, fantastic. go out, get a trailer, build a camera, well, and live inside and, it. And I th and I think uh, we all have some similar experiences. I mean, Jeremiah, you do a lot of printing. You do a lot of experimentation with uh, mm. with hands on things. Um, Adrian, you and your wife, you do a lot of uh, hands on when with her Etsy store. Yeah, um, we do. Yep. So, what does that do to you by making something with your hands? It slows you down. That's for sure. Oh, I think it's way more than that for me. It, no, I mean, yes, it, it does. Is. But I think for, for me, it's 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 an incredible thing for mental well-being and for yes. creativity and using different parts of your brain and, and of course, yeah, your, your body as well. You know, making things with your hands or, or whatever it might be. It it adds a totally different experience to, to life for, for me Getting, i mean yeah, yeah. I, I as somebody who spends too much of his time in front of a computer you yeah, know those sorts of things are my escapism right so yeah those are the things i do because that 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 helps me ground myself in the real world and you know if, if photography is all part of this as well um it's it's just uh it's just the other thing that that really lets you reset and calm down and process and all sorts of stuff so for sure. me, it's a it's a huge part of of what I yeah. do. And, and don't you need don't to you do. think you have to be ultra present to do a physical activity? In other words, you can't be really distracted if you're working on something with just a modicum of of sophistication. Uh, you know, you can't be doing two things at once. You have to focus on 
you know, if you're mitering a corner, you know, you, you can't just like slough it off. It's got to be exactly the right angle or it won't work. And so I think, I think that the physical processing um, is something that roots us. When I say slow down, I'm not just talking about in time. It just focuses our attention on the here and now. And I think that's a calming and, and delightful influence that we often have moved quite far away from. Yeah, for, for me, um, it has it, it, it was the entire week, even though I didn't do much in terms of the, the hands-on thing, because I was, I was holding the workshop, I was organizing, I was making sure everyone had the had the had the ability to do things and had the the means to do that um for me it was still like a like a vitamin injection just being around people who enjoy doing something with their hands that was a that was a really good experience um another project that we did which wasn't yeah not not really a project more of a a, a, a toy, a playground thing. <clears throat> have you guys heard of the fold scope? No, I don't think I have actually. There's a there's a professor at Stanford who invented with his group a foldable microscope. Oh, which that's is interesting. Which is, uh, I I think I think producing that costs them about a dollar. They have sold they have given away like a, a million or more to third world countries to kids to um to even scientists in the field because that thing is not just cheap if if you buy them they finance them giving away some of them um but that thing they they had to invent some new math to come up with a lens that can do 140x magnification okay um, interesting and you end up with having a proper almost proper micro microscope with you um anywhere so we ended up using that for photography as in uh let's find some some abstract stuff out there might be hair might be pollen might be fibers might be uh, a wing of an insect um and uh I wasn't sure if it would work, but everyone ended up loving it. So my my recommendation is if you have kids or if you have a kid inside yourself, then um, the full scope is a brilliant little piece of kit that will give you a lot of uh, a lot of rewarding a very rewarding way of looking at your surroundings and you can hold a smartphone up to it and take pictures straight from the thing so it is fun so foldscope.com this, this has got to be like part of the special source of of having a, a residential workshop of this type as yeah for me because and, and yeah you know, tell me if i'm wrong here chris but yeah you know, the 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 creativity the the innovation the the new things that you'd learn Oh, I've never heard of that. I don't think I, you know, and yes, the internet helps us learn, but there's nothing quite like learning from a group of like-minded people, is there? Oh, and and seeing them problem solve again because um, and and exchanging their findings because that thing you need you need twenty minutes of playtime with it to figure out how to hold it and how to operate it and how to. Uh, how to get photos out of it so it's it, it it there is an initial hurdle that will take i don't know 10 20 30 minutes for you to uh be comfortable with uh working with it and just just seeing the group help each other work with each other and come up with like amazing results within within 20 minutes someone had uh, had their led lights their rgb led lights out to backlight something in red and uh, people were like going around uh finding a puddle to get some water um with stuff in it uh someone someone got, got a needle and poked a hole in his finger to look at his blood cells <laughs> okay a little extreme, um, not but recommended yeah, but it it's it's i remember as a kid i had a microscope for 
like a year, my, my grandfather's old microscope. Um, and it changed the, wor the way I see the world. So just having that available and looking at things back home. So that experience, I, I try to give that experience to others. And um, it's a fun little toy. And it's more than a toy. So last but not least, um, someone brought a photo transfer um, kit of sorts. Have you heard of gelatin prints? That's so funny. I've been researching that all really? week. This is completely <laughs> coincidental. Um, with the gel jelly plate, they call it exactly. So, yeah. so jelly plate. Um, it's it's from a from a crafts um, yeah, from a crafts point of view. A lot of a lot of it's used a lot in scrapbooking and things like that. Um, but it also lends itself really well to doing photo transfers, as in take a photo and work with it. It, work it into something new and then what comes out are things like this yeah. <laughs> so you you end up with um with with a different medium and working with it again takes a bit of training but not much uh the entry hurdle is very very low um financially very low you can get these plates for 20 30 bucks i guess and you need some acrylic color and a roller and some um a laser printer helps because um laser prints work really well with it and then you end up um copying things in a in a in a way that is very satisfying because it did anybody try it with polaroid uh no not yet but the entire the entire group that did that they ended up with um like totally totally getting lost in the in the yeah. in the jelly prints also there's different mediums that you can use without the jelly block yes. which is you know you just basically coat the paper and yeah. then so, you, you get a transfer of a lots a, lots of different ways yeah, and and pictorico but th this one, this one ended up being like really accessible. That's the, that's the thing. A lot of these techniques um, are a bit daunting because you need like very special chemicals and a dark room and I don't know tools and they are difficult. I mean, just just look at brom oil print for example. Amazing results, but it takes you months to get good at it. Um, this. You probably you you probably up and running in an hour, and you get amazing results. So, it's funny that you researched that this week. How come? I, I, you know, I I ran across a an image, and it it was very water. It was on very uh, dense watercolor paper, and it had a really interesting photographic yet painterly way. And I I went, well, I wonder how they did that. Yeah, and so I just did a little dive into it and found, I'd never heard of a jelly plate before a week ago. And um, I was actually kind of backing in because I'm about to do some digital negatives on Pictorico, mm -hmm. you know, transparent and, and try to do some, uh, some gravure off that. So that was, that was my kind of going in. So of course I went into the deep dive about getting the best results from Pictorico, which is a, tran a, a transparent medium that you can use on a on a you know on a a, a gicle printer, and um, that led me from one thing to another, and of course then it was like oh jelly plate printing from Pictorico negatives like what the heck? and so it was like you know one step down at a time before you were in the sub basement. And uh, absolutely fascinating. And it turns out, you know, I, I have a roller and I have some medium. I don't have a jelly plate yet, but they're available just at the corner art shop. I mean, exactly. You know, they're, they're, they're like a, a half an inch thick gelatin like yeah. plate um, that is reusable. So you yeah. you have yeah, this clean, thing clean and you use it over and, and over. Again. You clean yeah. it off. And, um, and if you practice a bit, you can 
do amazing stuff with it. And yeah, you can work in layers, as in you have like a black and white photo of something, and then you can put backgrounds behind it and so on. It's like Photoshop, um, but in a very <laughs> physical, very hands-on way. Yeah. So, Like, for example, you take a picture like this and just a light coat of, you know, very transparent yeah. paint, color, medium and then do it again and you'll get an overlay in that way yeah it's, it's, so it's, so collages these kind of things are it's made for that it's totally made for that and so, then so if Chris, you i mean in, i'm interested because yeah, there's loads of really good stuff here you've got like four or five different things you've been talking to us about how do, yeah. how does this make you feel right how do you coming out of one of these workshops what, what's what's going on here in your heart and in your mind uh, i'm very very happy and satisfied that other people are having fun because that extends into me having fun so um yeah facilitating these kind of things is is my thing so that uh and uh, ju and just seeing other people learn something new and enjoy learning it i think is and, a, and is I a, guess is a good i mean clearly this is a working holiday it's not even a holiday it's just work isn't it for you but 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 in the best possible way oh uh, i, I come back yeah. fully recharged that's oh, good that's the thing you see are you you yeah. know are you i know you won't have time to pursue your own projects in that environment because you're 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 the, the leader of the group but you know do you do you come back full of energy fully inspired to you know lots of ideas of things you want to try is are you uh you, know, you come home like run run into the into the shed of you know, hammers and hammer and nails and bits of wood and, and build your own cameras and stuff like that is that what happens next possibly <laughs> <laughs> it was just an example you can like, you can choose your own project obviously no i mean i mean what 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 I find really wonderful is that it it gets me in touch with a lot of ideas. And you, you know how you find, how you get up a ton of input? Go on YouTube and just let the algorithm serve you things. And you get a ton of input. And a lot of that is, um, is very fleeting. Because, yes, you might learn something new, a new technique. But seeing it in in the field in action is a completely different thing it's a mm -hmm. different animal so so the the virtual nature of things is amazing because you have you get you get confronted with a lot of things online but in the real world taking it out of the virtual world changes everything so i i come i come home with a lot of experiences a lot of new things that that even even if I won't do them right away, it's it's now clearly part of my arsenal, and I can pull that out because I've I've seen it, I've touched it, I've uh, worked with some of it. So, you yeah. know, on the on the electronic end of it, on the digital end of it, and and this is something that I'm kind of actively trying to figure out the best way to apply it to my own process is building my own model. You know, I've talked about this before. Um, do I build it with 15 to 30 images? Do I build it with several hundred? Uh, do I build the images out of a consistent style? Do I kind of amalgamate everything that I've done? Um, and so experimenting with various sizes of, of model for my own, because I, I, I'm very interested in um, how my work influences my work, if that makes sense. And so you, you kind of, you know, I've been doing that. You know, I'll, I'll take an image and I will kind of conceptualize it, write it out, and further conceptualize the language, apply it to, say, GPT or this week GPT Omni, take that. I could generate something, I could take a prompt, I can move it to Midjourney, to Leonardo, and move it through various models that make a unique piece. And I'm trying to get the rough edges exposed so that there's not a sense of generic. And um, that feels to me as close as I can get to an actual physical building a camera. But, you know, it's, it's basically building a processor or a, mm -hmm. a, 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 a path to process. Uh, with something that is unique to your experience and output. And um, 
So there are kind of parallels to that. And at a certain point, how does that fuse into the real world? And, you know, for me, that's output printing, whether it's gravure, platinum, you know. Um, I saw a, a show this week, I saw a lot of photo work this week of somebody doing modern daguerreotypes um, at a gallery of Yosemite, um, a Chinese photographer. They are absolutely incredible. They're, they're, they were printed on like polished chrome. And so they are wow. exquisite. I mean, they're exquisite. And, and in another gallery, I saw the prints of, of I guess they were printed on, on pure copper, um, which is something that I've been doing. Not pure copper, but copper plate. Um, but, you know, just the, the kind of fusing of different kind of modern and old technologies is something that is extraordinary and really, really fun. So I'm, I'm also very... I hear an airplane. <laughs> Keep it's, going. Keep going. It's Venice, California, right? It's sirens and choppers and planes and squirrels. Um, I'm very interested in how the, the kind of hands-on DIY feel um, can rough the edges of AI to produce more human-like content that affects us emotionally. I think that's really interesting because most of what I see tends to slide into slick, generic, and kind of that mid-range of emulation of an aesthetic and trying to get away from that. Both music and um, and visual is, is something that um, is, it's very easy to do that when you're just working with a handmade camera and coated film because it is a unique experience. You're never going to coat the same chemical density twice. It's just almost making very... making one of a kind things is also very yeah. satisfying. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's right. that that might that might be one of the that might be the takeaway from from this episode. Do something with your hands. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely, and with other people as well, because it sounds like the group experience is clearly oh, a, very shared a massive experience. part yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, I think good stuff. All right. So, um, it, oh, by the way, next the future next year, May. Oh, sorry. The, the future is next year. May the nineteenth is the next workshop in the Abbey. So that sounds good. That sounds good. And the future of photography clearly involves working with your friends and at working yep. with cameras and and other bits of equipment that you can build and stuff like that. Yes. Very little to do with technology at all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's, let's, uh, let's switch this over to our picks of the week. I am going to look at Adrian first. What are we looking ah, okay. at? Okay. So, well, this week uh, I, I bring you uh, advance notice uh, of an exhibition. Actually, I say advance notice. It's probably only about, three days advance notice so uh, the fashion photographer Rankin is having uh, uh, is hold, ha having holding I don't know conducting an exhibition at the moment uh, of uh, called back in the dazed which is uh, a, a, an exhibition of his fashion photography uh, from 1991 to 2001 uh, something I shall I should try and get tickets to see although having said that so how many times do you, do you try and book uh, to or try, try and go see a photo gallery and you actually have to book a slot like you were at Disney World or, or the Pokemon Championships. I'm or just something looking like at that. the weird booking process here. You have like different dates into June um, and you click and then there are different slots and you have to like... Why is that? Expecting it On to be popular, popular exhibits, you want to make sure that you have the time to wander a gallery and right. be able to see the work instead of standing behind five people's heads and struggling to do so. Very true. Absolutely. Spend time. So they, they do that in order to make sure that the gallery is never um, overcrowded and that you could really explore that. All right. So yeah, so that's a, a show coming up in, in London, of course. Um, uh, I say, of course, um, uh, it's probably may, maybe of not course. obvious to everybody, but Rankin is British and he operates out of London. So, <laughs> so. Uh, uh, that helps. Adrian, I just want you to know that on the show that 
I will open mid-July here in Los Angeles. You don't have to book. Excellent. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, you that's good. Up whenever you want, you show up. So, that's Jeremiah, good. your pick. Well, speaking is of booking, another exhibition. Speaking of booking, first I'll talk about the Getty, which is you know arguably one of the most amazing centers of photographic research in the world, and their collection is nothing short of dazzling. I went to see this exhibit, which really was profound. It's called Nineteenth Century Photography Now. So you're able to look at these extraordinary images, all done with old and traditional um, techniques, whether it's bromide, salt, you know, daguerreotypes, canotypes. Um, and over the years, the history of photography is there with classics of, you know, again, from Bayard, Daguerre, Nadar, all of those amazing, their, their, their work, and then artists who are using those exact techniques in creating new work. And so you have, you know, you go and look at three or four amazing images of a historical landscape, and next to it, you'll have three or four artists working in that same technique. And so it bridges the gap of, you know, a century and a half of photography and photography processes that is just completely inspired. And I found myself like, and again, it's the Getty, so you have to book in advance, and it's a popular exhibit, but I found, you know, maybe there were 20 people in this exhibit, you know, looking. Um, and so you're able to spend a lot of time in front of all of these images and really absorb them. And I think that's also the difference between looking at something online on your phone, where we have an instinct, a tendency now to just keep swiping more and more and more. But when you're in a the presence of some of these, it's the opposite. You want to stay and you want to study and you want to look carefully. You want to look at the soles of a subject shoe or just the way they, their environment. That There's a detailing which is really extraordinary in, in the presence. But this is an exhibit I, I do hope it travels because it, it's sensational. At the same time, right across the... Um, you know, in the, the the next museum, the Getty is, you know, huge. Um, there was an exhibit of Bayard, which, you know, I won't talk about today, but is also an amazing and, and um, you know, a photographer of note. Arguably was, the inventor of photography. Of photography. <laughs> so so the, the, there's a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of stuff to deal with with Bayard in terms of uh, another uh, stuff for another day. Absolutely. Um, thank you. All right. So I brought a YouTube video and it is again by from of, of the channel Smarter Every Day. And uh, Destin is a bit of a film buff. And uh, he did this three part series of looking behind the scenes at Kodak and uh, doing like, like looking at how film is made in a very, very detailed, like three hour thing, which is amazing. Um, and he just went to see the solar eclipse and he teamed up with a professor who is very like super into that. And uh, they came up with an idea that he then executed. And that was to photograph the solar eclipse in phases, as in you, you, you mm -hmm. get the, the, the sun becoming more uh, smaller and smaller and smaller, and then the, the totality and so on, but to do it on slide film, as in on one piece of film. So <laughs> he goes out Oof. and um, ends up um, like really planning that because you have one piece of film and all these phases have to go on so you need a specific times to make it symmetrical and a nice composition and uh, so he has that timer running and people around him and his family and uh, while enjoying also taking these pictures and not being sure how it turned out so he ended up um, of course nailing it and it 
it's just it's just a great also well told story so um of of what you can do with film and what it means to do something like that with film so i found this uh a very awesome. a very good watch i shall go and watch that then definitely absolutely link is of course uh link to all the things we talked about um are in the show notes and with that let's start the outro music so um do something with your hands it's, it's very simple well now <laughs> well we, 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 every, everyone goodbye, everyone know, after fun. listening to this episode do something with it. It might be it might be so, gardening. It might be something else. But do I've been, something. I've, if it's, for what it's worth, I spent most of the day shifting and hauling furniture. <laughs> so so I've absolutely been working with my hands and, and that's lots more, of that's more. That's more. Do something with your well. back. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yes. Well, to write, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, it's. Yeah. Uh, but it is. It's a good. It's a good kind of a day, right? Doing that. All sort right. Of thing. It's definitely different. We'll be back next week with another episode of The Future of Photography. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Find us online. Come to our Discord. Until then, everyone, take care. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Bye.